all right so why is radiometry and shading important so we know that uh, shading itself has a as a critical role to play in defining structures in, in the world right uh, it certainly is very important for our perception so for example you know you can look at an image like that right obviously it's an image you don't know the three dimensional properties of what you're looking at but you can infer based on this image three dimensional aspects of what you're seeing same thing when we actually look at images of a lot of different things but we, we have an idea of the three dimensional structure but more importantly you look at an image like that you don't only really know the three dimensional structure but you have an idea of the physical properties of this object right you, you look at the image here and you start getting a feel for the textural properties that are present for that object so the question is how is that possible and if we understand how is it possible the more important question is can we use that computationally somehow to infer properties about objects that we are imaging okay. so well we want to know that and in order to understand that first we have to build an understanding of the illumination process and its transference to what we actually acquire and, and actually can measure on images which is pixel intensities okay. so what we want to try and do is understand if we capture an image and get a particular brightness value at a pixel what does that mean right. you work with a digital image you say you know this pixel has a value of 100 what does 100 mean right what is the relationship of the value that you have on the pixel with respect to a particular object that's sitting out in space that you've just imaged. Okay. Now, of course, if we want to understand that, we have to understand a little bit about the illumination as well as the radiometric transformation process. So now, let's say that we have some point on a particular object in space, in the 3D space. That point is going to get illuminated by some light source. Okay. And of course, that point that's receiving a certain amount of light is going to reflect a portion of it and that's what we're going to capture on our image okay. so the geometry we have seen okay. so we have seen the geometry that we have a point P in space we understand the relationship of the geometric transformation it undergoes and what is the relationship of point P in space to its projection P prime we have already studied that right? but what we have not studied is the illumination or the intensity at which a particular amount of light is being transferred through the lens and onto our imaging plane. So in order to build a model that can describe that, we have to study a variety of things. One, we have to understand a little bit about the properties of the light source. Right? We have to understand a little bit more about the surface reflectance properties of any object in space that we are actually trying to image. We also have to understand about the shape of that surface because that's going to dictate the orientation at which a certain amount of light is going to reflect off of that surface. Obviously, we have to understand the properties of the optics. We have to understand a certain amount of uh, uh, characterization of the camera that we are using, more specifically the exposure. right? Because we know that the longer the exposure, the more amount of light we are integrating. So we have to understand how that relates into this whole process. And then there are sensor characteristics. And when I talk about sensor characteristics, we are truly talking about uh, the actual conversion process in terms of the amount of uh, light captured the, the, um, and the process of digitization that allows us to translate that into some pixel value, uh, intensity value on a, on a pixel. All right, so let's first define some basic terms as we try to understand what is this relationship. So the two basic components that we have to understand is radiance and irradiance. Okay? Radiance is essentially the energy that is carried by a particular ray of light. Okay? And more often than not, we define that in terms of power. Okay? Power per unit area 
that is actually perpendicular to the direction of travel of the light. Okay. And it's subtended by a specific unit angle, right? a solid angle subtended in space. And the units that we typically describe this is in watts per square meter per steady. So steady being defined as defining the uh, unit subtended angle that we have. Irradiance, on the other hand, is actually the energy that is arriving at a particular surface. So it's the amount of energy that is now given uh, in, in terms of watts per meter squared, okay, and it can be measured as a relationship between the irradiance that you measure and the radiance of a particular ray of light. So the way to think of this is that if you have a ray of light coming in, one, the radiance is going to be described by the angle subtended with respect to the surface on which this particular ray is incident. And it's going to be integrated in order to compute the power over the solid angle, the unit angle that it subtends. So this particular ray of light carries the amount of energy that is equivalent to everything within that pole. And of course, we have we are describing that with respect to what falls on an area that is perpendicular to the ray of light. So in order to describe that, we basically, let's say this falls on a, on a patch which is like that, uh, the, the corresponding perpendicular patch will be described by uh, the relationship of the area that we have here plus the angle of the respect to the normal of that surface. So, so that is what forms the relationship between irradiance and radiance. Okay. Now, how do we describe this solid angle that a ray subtends, right? So how do we know or how do we try to capture this property of what this delta omega is? So the delta omega uh, is, is coming from some light source, okay? Now if I assume that that light source is some unit sphere somewhere, then I can think about defining that light source or the uh, subtended angle in terms of the actual patch that it creates on the surface that we are trying to measure the irradiance on divided by the distance it has traveled from a unit sphere. So every time we think of a subtended angle, we are conceptualizing that there is a light source which we are describing as a unit sphere, okay? And the actual angle subtended is being measured on the surface of this unit sphere as a particular unit angle. So that's how we actually describe this delta W or delta W. Now, of course, its projection on the surface that we are going to try to measure on is described with respect to the normal of the surface. And in order to compute that, you, know, you, can, you can write it as basically delta A or dA cos theta, uh, or we can describe that as dA prime, right? But that's just the foreshortened area of the patch on which this particular light is incident. Now, of course, uh, any unit angle that we're going to describe is always going to be uh, on the sphere that we have looked at or conceptualized, right? And uh, that, that's going to be across a hemisphere. So only on the top part of the sphere, obviously not on the bottom part. Okay. Now, if you plug this into our imaging geometry, right, what do we have? We have now a point P on some surface that will project onto P prime based on our geometry that we looked at describing our deep perspective, right, or a thin lens system. 
this would be a thin lens system, we know the relationship between P and P prime. What we want to now describe is the relationship between radiance and irradiance. So, what do we do? So, one, we know what OP is, right? We can describe OP based on triangulation. OP essentially being, if you will, the, the distance uh, from the uh, optical center to whatever the, the height of the P point is, right? So, OP we can describe simply by triangulation is nothing but Z divided by cos of alpha alpha being the angle subtended by the point. And similarly, OP prime will be Z prime divided by cos of alpha. Now, if you think of the thin length that we have, it basically, uh, all the rays that are coming in are going to fall on that lens. So the, the surface area that's actually exposed to the amount of light energy coming into it is basically pi r squared or you know, pi b squared by 4. So that's the area that we have for our lens. So what we want to compute first is the power that is transmitted from the point P to the lens. Right? So we can compute that and then say, you know, how much of that power is going to get transferred to the image plane. So we can break it up as, as two separate calculations. So how much power do we have? The amount of power we have can be described by L omega dA cosine of beta, where beta will be the largest angle that we make from the point P to the edge of the lens. Right? So this is the, the full angle, or you can think of it as the, as the uh, normal from the surface that extends out that still falls within the collecting range of a lens. So we have that angle. Now, the delta A cos theta, right, is, uh, is, is just the amount of area that over which we are collecting the energy, right? L, we'll, we'll look at it in a second, omega, what is omega? Omega is actually the subtended angle for the lens. So omega basically describes the little patch that we are collecting the light from or over. So in terms of our previous understanding of conceptualization of unit sphere, omega is the equivalent of the solid angle subtended. So it's the delta omega that can describe the total energy that's coming in. Okay. So what do we have? If we have to describe that, then omega is basically the delta A cos theta, right? It's exactly what we looked at before, right? So uh, there you go. So that's your description of what the delta omega is, right? This is a subtended angle over which the energy is being collected, right? And we describe it as the foreshortened area divided by the square of the radius. Okay. So if we translate that over here, that's what omega is. It's the area times cos alpha divided by the radius from the light source, right? The light source in this case being P. So that's our radius, right? Of course, so radius squared gives us this. And we can simplify that, and that simplifies to this. So as a result, the amount of energy that's falling on the lens can be written to that. Now, of course, I have to also measure the amount of lens that uh, amount of energy that is going on to the image point, right? So that's the irradiance coming in, and basically the irradiance is nothing but the amount of energy that got there now projected onto the patch corresponding to the point P, right, which has the area delta A prime. And we can write it out 
as well in the same fashion. So we have the area that's projected down uh, uh, onto the foreshortened area. So now I can plug everything back in, right? And I can end up with a relationship between E and L. So what we find is that the relationship actually between E and L is a linear relationship. And the, the change in irradiance is going to be dictated by so, three things. One, of course, being the diameter of the lens, the distance in terms of the focal length, right? And of course, this particular angle subtended by the object in space, right? So there's a so what that means is that as the object moves sort of towards the periphery, right, this amount of radiance coming in is going to start changing and of course in this case decreasing the amount of irradiance you capture. Now, there is of course uh, uh, another process that happens when you actually take this amount of energy and convert it into some pixel values and we'll look at that in a minute. But if you think of the change in alpha okay, under this relationship, um, look at what we have. I mean, we have this relationship to the power of 4. So small changes when objects are further away and small changes in subtended angles normally don't make much of a difference. Okay? And that's exactly what happens when we perceive things. Right? When you have dis the objects that are at a distance, you move a little. right? Obviously, when you move, the angle is changing. But we don't actually see all of a sudden the change in uh, the amount of energy coming in. We don't see that you know there's a shift in uh, the illumination properties of some object out there. Because, because the angle is very, very small, right? So small changes in angles don't actually amount to a lot of change in the irradiance. Now, on the other hand, as the objects go sort of more and more away from the optical axis, as your angles start to become very large, you start seeing these drops in irradiance. And more often than not, that is not because of this relationship, but it's more often because of the vignetting effects that you start real seeing due to the presence of a lens. So generally, this linear relationship holds very well when you have objects that are more or less in, in front and at distance from the camera. So if we had to sort of summarize this relationship specifically for a thin lens model, what we have is that the irradiance is going to be linearly related to the seen radiance that we have. It's also going to be proportional to the area of the lens, right? And it's inversely proportional to the square distance between the lens and the image plane, so the focal length. And as I said, the irradiance is going to fall off as the angle between the viewing ray and the optical axis is going to increase. Now, interestingly enough, if we know this equation, the question becomes, can we actually calibrate a camera using an image which is completely textureless? So now, instead of using a checkerboard pattern, can I go to an image which has absolutely no corners or no texture and use that in order to calibrate my camera? And it's a rather interesting paper. Of course, there are certain assumptions that we have to make when we actually do this. Uh, we have to assume that the surface we are imaging is Lambertian and so on and so forth. Uh, so we're not going to uh, mix uh, what happens to, to reflectance in terms of uh, the particular model system that we described. But this is one of the papers uh, that you have on the course site for you to read. Okay? Um, it's very interesting because uh, now you have to think of the entire calibration process that we just talked about in a, in a very different way. You're, you're not actually doing this based on 
point correspondence mechanism, but rather based on a radiometric formulation. Okay. So uh, oh, please, please do read this paper because it's a, it's an interesting read, uh, and you will get.